waves is a misnomer. It's, it makes it sound like the waves don't move. But they do. But it looks like they don't. Okay? If I get a standing wave pattern forming in a medium, it looks like that pattern doesn't change. And the pattern doesn't change. But that doesn't mean that the waves creating the pattern aren't moving. They are. Okay? What happens is we get all these waves traveling past each other continuously in the same medium. Okay? And if I've got waves trying to occupy the same space at the same time, what do I get? I get interference. Now, because all the waves have the same frequency, the same speed, the same wavelength, okay, and are reflecting back and forth, okay, they constantly interfere in the same places. And they create patterns of destructive interference and constructive interference. And that's why we get a, a pattern on the medium that looks like it doesn't change. It's simply because the waves keep going back and forth, but since they're all identical, they always make the same thing happen in the same place. Right? So there'll be parts of the medium that never move, and parts of the medium that are moving like crazy. Okay? So standing waves are important if we're trying to produce uh, music from a musical instrument, for example. Okay? We want waves to interfere with each other in such a way that they get louder or quieter. Louder, yeah. We want those, those waves to interfere constructively and get louder okay, and resonate. Okay? And when they resonate, they, then they uh, can produce louder sounds that we can hear. Okay? Um, that's, a, that's a point where we're using it constructively. Standing waves can be very destructive. Okay. If they form in a structure, they're very, very bad. Okay? Because they're going to create areas where there's a lot of constructive interference. And if we're talking about a structure, that means the structure is doing what at those places? Moving a lot. That's generally bad for most structures since they're supposed to be somewhat rigid. Okay? You certainly don't want a building okay, to resonate. If it does, it'll fall down. Okay? And that's what happens okay, in things like earthquakes and stuff like that. We don't want a building to resonate. We want it to not resonate so that it doesn't shake and waver and do things like that. Okay? And you saw there for, for a minute the other day in that video the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Okay? This other bridge that was doing this weird like twisting thing. It looked like it was fake, except it's not. Okay? That was actually filmed in like the 40s. It was actually a real bridge that did that. Okay? And it did it because of wind. Right? The wind just blew across it in such a way that it created waves on the bridge. And just for a while, the wind didn't go away, and the bridge just kept getting more and more wavy okay? until finally it didn't take it anymore and it fell down. I'll show you the whole thing today because okay? it's a great example of when standing waves go bad. Okay? We definitely don't want those to happen in a structure. Okay? People learned valuable lessons about the construction of a suspension bridge from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Okay? And we also learned lots of valuable things about the construction of tall buildings in earthquake-prone areas okay? um, from watching what happens in earthquake-prone areas when buildings fall down. Okay? We can figure out ways to make these things uh, not resonate. Okay? It's even important here. Okay? We have a lot of tall buildings in Calgary. Right? And we have a lot of strong winds that typically come from the same direction and can be sustained for long periods of time. Right? Anyone ever been on top, like near the top floor of any of those buildings on a really windy day? Okay. Did you feel nauseous? No. Yeah. Some people are sensitive enough that they can actually feel the building. It is. Because it does. Okay. If you're in a really tall building in downtown Calgary and you're near the top floor on a windy day, okay, there are some people that would have to go home from work. Right, because they would get physically ill, because they'd be able to feel the movement of the building on a windy day. Okay? We want the building to flex a little bit. Okay? If it doesn't flex at all, then it risks just snapping off. Okay? But at the same time, we don't want it to flex and then have that flex travel all the way down the building, reflect off the foundation, and start traveling back up the building again. Okay? Because if it does that, it's going to meet the new waves from the next flex. Okay? And if that happens, then we'll start getting areas of constructive interference forming in the building. And then the building will do this, and it'll fall over. Okay? And that's bad. We don't want All right? It's also why the World Trade Center didn't fall down when the first plane hit it. Okay? It didn't fall down right away. And in fact, it wasn't, it wasn't even the 
the actual impact that caused it to fall down. It was actually the heat from the fire okay, that weakened the uh, support columns. That's actually what caused the, the uh, World Trade Center to fall on September 11th. Okay? Um, but when the planes hit it, it certainly would have caused a wave to travel through the building. Okay? But it wasn't. the building was constructed so well that that didn't cause it to fall. Okay? Most buildings of a plane, it's, it, you know, that would kind of be the end of it. Right? But you know, these ones withstood that impact for a very long period of time. Okay, uh, so we're going to look at standing waves and how they result from repeating patterns of interference. We're going to look at how those patterns get formed and we're going to learn the proper names for the areas of constructive and destructive interference in a standing wave pattern. And then we're going to look at some problem solving to do with standing waves. Okay, so we'll start off with just what does a standing wave look like? So, okay, so what we've got here are kind of freeze frame pictures of those wave patterns that we created on the spring. Okay, um, the one on the bottom okay, is our first or fundamental frequency. Okay, there's a certain frequency that I had to shake that spring at in order to get this wave pattern to form. Any other frequency would not result in that waveform. It would just be a jumbled mess. Okay, once I get that frequency figured out, then I get that waveform and it's pretty stable. Right, so that's what we call F1, or our fundamental frequency. Okay? This frequency here, this waveform, was how many times bigger than F1? Two times. So, get that two. Okay? Everybody all right with that? And then this one would be F3. Right. Now, how many wavelengths did we say was on the, the spring in this first one? Okay, so it's, this was lambda over 2. Okay, this was one, one wavelength, so lambda. And this is how many lambdas? 1.5. Okay, or 3 lambda over 2, whichever. Okay, uh, but that's the wavelengths we have. Because this here, okay, is one wavelength. So that means that, that from here to here is one wavelength, and this is another half. Okay, this was one half. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. Okay, the thing that stays the same in this situation is actually the speed of the waves, because I didn't change the medium at all. Right? It was always the same spring. Gavin and I were always the same distance apart, so we didn't alter the properties of the spring. All right, so a standing wave is an effect that can occur when two or more waves travel through the same place at the same time. The pattern itself is a result of both constructive and destructive interference. Okay, so we said this was an area of constructive, constructive, this was an area of destructive. Okay, and there's areas of destructive at either end. Okay, and same here, constructive here, destructive here, destructive here. Okay, so we get these areas of constructive and destructive interference. Okay, and depending on how fast or what frequency we shake the spring, okay, we get them in different places. Okay, so that's kind of the top view of what we were doing. Okay, um, so we have this, the string in this case is just attached to a wall, so it's a fixed end. Okay, um, the areas of constructive interference we call antinodes. The areas of destructive interference we call nodes. Okay, so nodes are places that do not vibrate at all, okay, because they are an area experiencing complete destructive interference. So an area of destructive interference is called a node. Right? And then an area of constructive interference is the opposite. Okay? They're antinodes. those ideas there. All right, and then just the same thing here. We don't use the terms overtones, okay, just so you're aware, because we find that that gets confusing. Okay, we have the fundamental frequency, okay, and then we've got our next frequency, next frequency. We'll give you the names here in just a second. All right, so the, the term we use instead of overtones is we use the term harmonic, okay? The first frequency that harmonizes or resonates on the spring is our fundamental frequency or the first harmonic. 
Okay, that's the one that gave us the half a wavelength pattern on the screen. Okay, the second, again, we don't, we don't use these overtones. Okay, the second um, frequency that makes that pattern is what we call the second harmonic. It's twice the frequency of the first. Okay, and so we would get the full wavelength on it. Okay, then the third harmonic, fourth harmonic. What you'll notice, and the reason we do it this way, is the number of the harmonic is equal to the number of what do we call these? Antinodes. Okay. So, however many antinodes there are, that's which harmonic frequency you're on. Okay, when we're talking about waves on a spring. All right. So, it is important to remember, okay, that F1, okay, this is F1, this is F2, okay, they are multiples of each other. If this is 10 hertz, this is 20 hertz, this is 30 hertz, 40 hertz, they're always going to be multiples of each other. Okay. It's how we create uh, musical octaves, okay, things like that. Uh, you know, if we have uh, one C note, the next C note would be the next harmonic up, okay, in the line along the instrument. Okay, and kind of follow me there. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, a string instrument, a wind instrument, whatever. Okay, they're all producing standing waves, okay, that look like this. Well, sort. Of, okay, obviously you don't get a weight, you don't get a guitar string to do this. Okay. A guitar string always looks like this waveform. How do you make it vibrate with a different frequency? Uh, you can, yeah. When you're tuning it, you can crank on the tensioner okay, and, and make it make different sound. But if I want to not mess with that part, but I want to make a higher frequency sound, right, you put your finger in a different place on the, on the spring. Or, sorry, on the string. Okay. If I'm using the whole string, then I'm going to get a low frequency of sound. Okay, but if I pinch that string against the bridge, handle, fret, 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 that's what I, I don't play any of those Okay, yeah, against the fret, okay, that thing where you put your hand, okay, if you pinch it lower down, then it can't vibrate past where you've blocked it off. You've essentially made your finger a fixed end, and now only this much of the string can vibrate instead of this much. And so, it'll vibrate at a higher frequency because it's a shorter wavelength. Right? And so we produce different frequencies of sound by doing that. That's why you see someone who's playing the guitar constantly moving their fingers to different places and pinching different strings. Okay, that's how they make the different notes on it. All right. So standing wave patterns arise because identical waves travel on the string okay, in opposite directions. So they reflect off one end and they come back. Okay, they reflect again. They go back and forth. You're constantly making new ones, so you're putting more and more wave energy in there. And eventually you achieve some kind of balance where the, the spring just continues to move. Okay? If this is a bridge, like the Tacoma Narrows bridge, okay, then you start getting uh, waves of a greater and greater amplitude. So. All suspension bridges are designed to actually be able to withstand small amounts of oscillation. By their nature, they have to be able to do that. They're a big, long span held up by a cable. Okay? A cable is just a string made out of metal. Right? It's going to have waves travel in it at some point in its existence, so they have to be built to tolerate that. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was no exception. Okay? It oscillated up and down all the time. Small oscillations. Okay. People would still even drive over it okay, while it was doing this. And they could see sick part of the window, but they, they would still drive across even with the bridge doing this. Okay. The problem became when it would get really crazy. Then it wouldn't be safe to drive on. It would oscillate just vertically up and down for a while. Okay. The real problem was when that vertical oscillation became a twisting one. Okay. And that happened because sustained winds kept blowing against one side, pushing it up. Okay? What was allowed to happen because of the design of the bridge was these waves would travel through the bridge, reflect off the other end, and come back. And then reflect off that end and go back. Meanwhile, the wind keeps putting more and more wave energy into the bridge. So the amplitude of those oscillations got bigger and bigger and bigger until the bridge couldn't take it anymore and it collapsed. Right? What we do now is we actually design bridges so that the tension on both sides of the bridge is different. Okay. The problem with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was the tension was essentially the same on both sides, in both cables. Since that tension was the same, the waves could travel at the same speed on both sides of the bridge. If they travel at the same speed, they'll have the same wavelength and the same frequency. 
and then they can interfere and produce a standing wave pattern. If you make the tension on the on opposite on either side different, then the waves travel at different speeds on each side. Thus, they'll have different wavelengths, and they'll never be able to set up a constructive interference pattern that would result in the oscillation of the bridge becoming catastrophic. Okay, that's how they design bridges. Now, they do the same thing with really tall buildings. Okay, they'll actually um, in earthquake prone areas build the the building on essentially big springs big shock absorbers, okay? And each corner of the building will have a spring that's of a different tension. So that when a wave travels through the building and it hits the spring, it's dampened slightly, but it's dampened differently at each corner, okay? And so they take longer to bounce off that dampener and they don't ever set up a constructive interference pattern in the building, allowing it to oscillate too much, okay? So these are all things that we've learned and thus we design structures to take care of them. All right, so I'm going to show you this Tacoma Narrows bridge thing because it's crazy, okay? Okay, uh, so with standing waves, okay, the reason we have an area of destructive interference at either end, so a node at either end, is because whenever a wave comes in and hits a fixed end like here, it always produces its exact opposite because it reflects back, inverted, okay? So you're always going to have an anti, or sorry, a node at either end because of that. Right, so that's just what this slide is saying here. All right, so if we're looking at musical instruments and standing waves for string instruments, okay, we produce standing waves simply by plucking the string and creating the fundamental form on the string. Okay? If we want to produce a different frequency, we can't make that, we can't make this happen on the string. Okay? We can't make it have like a, an up and a down part. Okay? It won't do that. So all we do is shorten the string by pinching it against the fret okay, so that it's lower down and the wavelength is decreased. If the wavelength is decreased, then we'll produce a higher frequency of sound. Okay, all right with that. Now, for wind instruments, okay, wind instruments rely on a resonating column of air. Okay, so we call them air columns. Right? Uh, as long as we can make the air in there, uh, inside this column, resonate will get a sound. Okay? Um, so if you've ever like blown across the top of a bottle, you okay, have a pop bottle and it's like half full and you blow across the top, you get the hum. Okay? You're essentially creating the simplest musical instrument okay, by creating an, an, uh, a closed air column okay, or a column of air that is resonating. You can do the same thing if you have a crystal glass. Okay, so if you have like really fancy wine glasses made of crystal okay, and you run your finger along the rim, you can make it hum. Anyone ever done that? Okay, that's again. All you're doing is you're making the crystal vibrate, and then that vibration is passed to the air sitting inside the glass. Okay, that air begins to resonate, and you get this sound. Depending on how much liquid is in the glass, you get a different frequency. If the glass is nearly full, you hear a very high pitched sound. If the glass is completely empty, you hear a much lower pitch because the wavelength is longer. Because the the column of air is longer. Okay, everybody kind of follow me on that? Right, so I'm going to demonstrate that because I've got an air column here that we're going to use. Okay, and what we're going to do with it is we're going to actually use it to calculate what the speed of sound in this room is today. Right? Don't look at me like I'm crazy. I've done it before. All right. So the type of air column we're going to use is a closed air column. Okay? We call it closed because it's only open at one end. Okay? The other end is closed because it's going to be full of water. Okay? So the sound waves are going to travel down through the tube. They're going to reflect off of the water and come back up. As long as I make that tube the right length, I'll get a standing wave pattern like I had in the spring form in the tube. If I get that to happen, what will we hear? Yeah, we'll hear a loud sound. Anywhere else, I'm not going to hear a loud sound. And I'll even find places where I hear no sound at all. That would mean that what is there at the top of the tube then? A node or an antinode? If I hear no sound at all, I would have a node at the top. If I hear a really loud sound, it means I have an antinode at the top, an area of constructive interference versus destructive interference. All right? So. <laughs> this one. 
So we're going to use a frequency of 440 hertz. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to measure the various lengths at which we get the loud noises to appear. Okay, anytime we have a loud noise appearing, okay, we're going to have um, we're going to have an antinode forming at the top. So our first one, the water level will be pretty high, and the column of air will be very short. Okay, and we'll get a standing wave pattern that looks like this. So there'll be an anti-node at the top, and this will be the node here where it's reflecting off of the water. Okay? I'll get a second point, okay? and when I get the second kind of loud point, that's going to look like this. Right? So the water would be here. Okay? Still getting an anti-node at the top. Okay? If I get this node at the top, then I'll hear nothing at all, okay? And I might be able to get three, okay, if I'm lucky, so there'll be very little water here at the bottom, okay, and it would look like this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to record the length of the column of air. From that, will I be able to calculate the wavelength of the waves? Okay, how many wavelengths are in the tube right here? Uh, it, this is tricky. So that's what one full length of a standing wave looks like. So it's a quarter, right? So the first sound I hear would be equal to one quarter of a wavelength. The second sound I hear is going to be three quarters. Okay. Here's here's a half. Here's another quarter. Three quarters of a wavelength, and this will be. One and a quarter wavelengths, or five quarters. Yeah. Okay, so those should be the places where I hear sound, and that'll help me get the wavelength. And then from that, I'll be able to calculate the speed of sound in this room. Okay, so I got 440 hertz tuning fork, okay, and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this tube out of the water, okay? Whatever, wherever the water is on the tube is going to be our length, okay, of the air column. Everybody kind of follow me there? Mm -hmm. So, Karen, you're going to tell me what the lengths are, okay, because I'll be, I'll be concentrating on doing this. We'll have to read it for me, all right? I'm going to move close enough to you and see it. Okay, did you guys hear it there, how it got louder? Okay, so that was our first point, and that was at 0.19 meters. Okay, now our next one should be about how many times longer than that? Three times longer. If that's one quarter of a wavelength, the next one in here should be at around 60 centimeters, somewhere in there. Okay. 
and we should be able to get another one somewhere around 87, 88, somewhere in there. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. That's it. We're going to use an average in 95. Okay. All right. So those are the waveforms or the places where we got okay, the anti-nodes to form. All right, so we said here that 0.19 meters represented a quarter of a wavelength, okay? So if I want to get one full wavelength, what do I do with this number? Multiply it by 4 or divide it by 0.25, okay? So, yeah, I just did my math wrong. Okay, uh, so we're getting a wavelength there of 0.76 meters. Okay, we'll see what we get for this one. So this one's three quarters of a wavelength. So we're going to take that uh, 0.58 and divide by 0 0.75. 0 0.77, so pretty close. Okay, and then our last one, okay, 0.95 divided by 1.25. Okay, 0.76, so we're like right on. All right, so we'll say our wavelength here is 0.76 meters. We got that twice, okay? So if my wavelength, so sorry, this is my frequency. My wavelength is 0.76 meters. Then the speed of sound can be calculated by simply going F times lambda. All right, so um, times 400, sorry, 440. Okay, so I'm getting 334 meters per second. That's a little low, okay? According to just like the temperature in here, it should have been a little higher than that. But something else that can affect the speed of sound in air is altitude, air pressure, okay? And so we could have a little bit of a difference there in accounting for that, right? But it's a pretty accurate way to get the speed of sound in air is to use that air column, right? So what you do with a, with a wind instrument and using a vibrating column of air like we just did, okay, is you essentially change the length of the air columns. So if you're playing uh, like a flute or a saxophone or something like that, you press different keys. And when you press those keys, you allow the air to escape in different places, essentially manipulating the length of the air columns, okay? Um, what sets up the vibration in a wind instrument is either a reed, so if you're playing like the saxophone or something like that that has a reed on it and you blow across the reed, the reed vibrates, or if you're playing like the tuba or the trumpet or something like that, it's actually your lips. Okay, you push your lips and you make them make that sound, okay, and you keep doing that, okay, and that's what actually causes the vibration inside the horn, okay, inside that column of air. Okay. All right, so that's how the wind instruments work. Okay, we're going to look now at both open and closed air columns. Very few instruments are actually a closed air column. Most of them are open air columns, which means they're actually open at both ends. That gives you a much wider range of frequencies that you can produce. A closed air column produces a very narrow range of frequencies. So really about the only uh, instrument that's a closed air column would be when moonshiners have a hoe down after making an action, they go across the top of the jugs. Okay? <laughs> it starts out, everybody's like really high pitched, and by the end of the night it's like, because they're all, they're all in. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, in a closed air column, okay, we were, we were talking about these waveforms before, okay, wave patterns are formed that always have a node at the closed end, okay, it's a fixed end, the sound waves hit it and they bounce off, right, so we always have a node at one end, okay, um, because closed air columns have a node at one end, they can actually only make sounds every other frequency. Okay, remember we said there's, a, there's harmonics at F1, F2, F3, F4, and all of those things. Okay? But with a closed air column, if I draw the second waveform, it looks like this. Okay? 
Okay? How many wavelengths are in there? A half. So when it's lambda over 2, I have a node at the top. What do I hear? Nothing. Okay? I hear absolutely nothing at F2. That's the advantage of an open air column. An open air column resonates at F1, F2, F3, at all of them. Okay? But a closed air column, because there's always a node at one end, can only resonate at odd numbered frequencies. F1, F3, F5, F7, and so on. Okay? Everybody follow me there. So that means if you ever got like a question about closed air columns and it said calculate the fundamental frequency, you'd be calculating F1. Then it might follow up with what's the next frequency you would hear? F3. You won't hear anything at F2. Okay, it's a common trick that can get played on you okay, about closed air columns. You have to remember that at F2, there is no sound at all. The next sound you hear is actually three times the fundamental frequency because that's the next one that produces an antinode at the opening to the pipe. Okay. All right. Uh, so in your or on your formula sheet, sorry, you'll get a formula that looks like this. Lambda equals 4L. Okay, this is the um, closed air column formula. The wavelength of the fundamental frequency, so this one, okay, is four times the length of the column of air. Okay, because we had how many wavelengths? One quarter. Okay, so at the fundamental frequency for a closed air column, you have one quarter of a wavelength in the column of air. So if you multiply the length of the air column by 4, you will have the wavelength. Okay? Questions usually work that way. They give you information about the fundamental frequency and ask you to work from there so that you can use that formula. Okay? Now, I mean, could you figure it out if they gave you F3? Yes. You just have to know that there's three quarters of a wavelength in there instead of one quarter. Okay? But most questions will allow you to use this formula here okay, uh, for the fundamental frequency. Yes. All right. Any other questions about the closed air columns? Okay. Now, open air columns, okay, like we say, are open at both ends. So if they're open at both ends, okay, then you've got to have something producing the vibration, okay, and all the reflections actually occur off the inside of the pipe. Okay, so that's where the reflections occur, because obviously there's no there's nothing to reflect off of down here. But that produces excuse me, an antinode at both ends of the pipe. Okay? Meaning, again, we can get a wider range of frequencies. Okay? In an open air column, this is F1, this is F2, this is F3, this is F4. It resonates at all of its harmonic frequencies. Okay? There's a closed air column, only resonates at every other one. All right, so in our open air column here, there's how many wavelengths in here? Half. Right? Because this is a quarter of a wavelength and that's a quarter of a wavelength. Okay? So there's half a wavelength in an open air column at its fundamental frequency. That's why this is the formula for an open air column. Lambda is two times the length of the tube, not four. Okay? Closed air column, it's four times the length of the tube because you have a quarter of a wavelength. Okay? And this one here, it's um, two times the length of the tube. Now, another thing to remember. This has to be a column of air. Okay. If I have a jug or a glass or something like that that's partially filled, okay, I need to only take into account how long the column of air is. Okay, so sometimes you have to read a question carefully. Okay, it could be talking about you know this this tube right here, and it says you have you know a tube that's 50 centimeters long that's half full with water. How long is my column of air? 25 centimeters. I have to, you know, read things carefully and make sure I don't miss a key piece of information like that, or I'm going to get all my answers wrong because I didn't take into account that only the part of it was actually an air column and the other wasn't. Okay, so things to consider there. Okay, so we're going to go over a couple of. Um, yeah, let's go over this one here together. I'll give you guys a second to get it written down, okay? and then uh, we'll go over it together.
Okay, so in this question here, it's telling us we have a tuning fork that has a frequency of 384 hertz. Okay, and it's held above an air column just like I did a minute ago here. As the column is lengthened, closed pipe resonant points are found when the air column is 67 and a half centimeters. All right, so they're telling me okay, the length of the tube is 0.675 meters. Okay, what are the possible wavelengths for this data? And if the speed of sound is greater than 300, what's the actual wavelength and actual speed of sound? All right, so basically what they're telling me is you got a resonant point at this length. But it didn't tell me whether that was the first, second, or third resonant point. It just told me there was one here. So this could have been the first one, okay, where we were in like this situation, or it could have been this one. It could have even been this one, okay, where there was very little water in there, and I had that waveform, okay? It didn't tell us. It's just telling us the length of the tube is 0.675, right? So can I kind of just guess and check here and figure out which one would have been most likely? Yeah, okay? If it was this one, then the actual wavelength is how many times this number? Four times, okay? If this is the waveform that's in the tube and this distance here is 67.5 centimeters, then the wavelength is four times that number. Okay? To me, that seems like it's kind of big, but we can check it. So uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.675 times 4, all right? So there's my wavelength. Yeah, that's definitely not going to be right, okay? Because V equals F times lambda, okay? If my frequency is 384 hertz and I multiply that by 2.7, that's definitely way more than 330 meters per second. You agree? Okay. So that's probably not the right answer. All right. If it's this one, then it represents how much of a wavelength? Three quarters. All right. So I'm going to take my 0.675 and divide it by 0.75, three quarters. Okay. 0.9. I like that. That looks like it might work for me. Okay. Because my frequency is 384 hertz and my wavelength is now 0.9. Well, 384 times 0.9 is going to give me something reasonable for the speed of sound in air, right? Like 300 and some meters per second. Okay, so it was definitely that one. Okay, it was the five, or sorry, the uh, three quarters okay, waveform as opposed to the one quarter waveform. Right? We kind of follow what we did there. I'm never going to give you a question. We're going to make you guess and check. Okay, I'll, I'll probably ask you a question more like calculate the fundamental frequency of the speed of sound is this much and your length of tube is this much, okay? Um, and I would tell you whether that was the first resonant point or not. Okay. Um, I want you guys to try number three here, okay? Um, but this one has to do with a spring. Okay, it's not an air column, it has to do with a spring. So my recommendation for starting question number three would be to draw a picture of that spring. Okay, so you can get an idea of how many or what your wavelength is. That's one of the things you're going to have to get from your diagram. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time okay, on three. If you finish number three, then try number four. All right, I'll give you a couple minutes and we'll go through those together. All right, so for number three, it tells us we have a standing wave generated in a, in a spring that's stretched to a length of 6 meters. Okay, so we know the length of the spring is 6.00 meters. Okay, and it says the standing wave pattern consists of three antinodes. So it looks like this. Okay, and we know that this distance is 6.00 meters. How many wavelengths are in there? One and a half. Okay, so if there's one and a half wavelength in, in six meters, then the wavelength is four. Okay, how did I figure that out? I divided six by 1.5. There were one and a half waves on there in six meters, so I went six divided by one and a half waves. Okay, and I got that my wavelength is 4.0 meters. Now that I know that, and the frequency at which I'm moving the spring, 
I can calculate the speed at which the waves are traveling on the spring, f times lambda. Okay? And then people now really realize that your legal have thought that question. Yeah. All right, so we know, guys, tomorrow we're going to be working on problem solving to do with standing waves. Monday I'm going to teach you Doppler effect. That's it. Tuesday I'll do the unit exam review. Wednesday is your unit exam. Okay, Thursday we'll do final exam review and same on Friday. 